And of course, some may say, well, because she's married to you. Amen. And don't be jealous. Um, so we'll go to God in prayer. I want to pray for this, this uh, lesson tonight or this message, whatever it turns out to be. And I pray that God will touch each of you that are watching by video or those that are in this room today or tonight. And we'll pray that God would have his way. Amen? Amen. Listen, just because it's Wednesday doesn't mean you should just get mellowed out. You should still be excited. You may say, well, I'm tired. I love it when people say, man, I don't know. I always tell them, pastor. They'll say, pastor, I, man, it's just, I just had to work all way. You know, I, I was so everybody else in the building. What made you special? Come on. Oh, y'all didn't like that. Come on. Okay. Let's, let's pray. Can, if you have a need, though, in all seriousness, let's pray right now, and then we'll, we'll get into this. But, Father, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, and we come to you one more time. And, God, we're laying these people, the ones we've asked you, God, and requested out loud, we're laying them at your feet, God. We're trusting them in your care. Let healing virtue flow through their bodies, God. Let comfort and peace come up over their spirit, body, and mind, God. Let them have peace with procedures, peace and healing. Let them trust your report over man's report. Let strength come to my wife's body, God, and strengthen her and heal her in Jesus' name. Touch this lesson tonight. Minister the to the hearers tonight, God. Let the ones watching by video feel the anointing power of the Holy Spirit tonight. In Jesus' name we ask, believe, and we pray. And everybody would say amen. 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 Turn around and wave at somebody. You can probably find somebody to wave at. You won't even have to get up. Good to see y'all. Good to see y'all. Amen. Glad you're here. Um, we had a, a good service on Sunday, and then Monday, and we'll say maybe more on Sunday, next Sunday, this coming Sunday, whichever. But we had a wonderful turnout for our trunk or treat, and so kudos to everybody that did trunks and helped and, and cleaned, and just so you'll know, those that were here, I know y'all did a fantastic job picking up trash, because I was up here with my pinchers and my bucket and going all over the parking lot. It's amazing how you can walk over the same spot and find different things. Come on. You walked over it 42 times, and there's a bright green starburst. How did you miss it? <laughs> so <laughs> there was gum. I actually thought about eating a piece of that gum, and I'm being serious. Uh, I picked it up and opened it, and it was kind of ucky on the other side, and I thought, well, I better not eat that. But if I had Aubrey Ann, <laughs> my granddaughter, no problem. Um, but anyway, uh, in all seriousness, what a wonderful, wonderful testimony for our church, to, for people to get to know who we are, to see the love that comes from us and the fellowship. And many of y'all walked around and greeted people and, and saw people and, and was not, you know, it was just great. And uh, the hot dogs went out good. And I, I think I may have told one or two of you in here, somebody had come up to me and said, hey, pastor, why don't we do, uh, why don't y'all do hamburgers and, and hot dogs? And I thought, look, buddy. <laughs> Hot dogs are a lot cheaper and a lot easier to cook. So eat the hot dog, it's free, and don't worry about it. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'll, I won't cut up much about that. I just wanted to let you know I wanted to thank you guys for your hard work, and it was just a wonderful time. And I got to say it publicly <clears throat> um, Michael Everett and Crystal Everett, Jurassic Park, uh, everybody did a great job. That killed, that, y'all killed it, okay? But the one, I got to say it, and if y'all get upset, that's just too bad. You'll get over it later on. Pastor Nick killed it on Luigi. <laughs> I was cracking up, man. But I got to say it publicly. He did. Go ahead. You can wait. Go ahead and give it up, Nick. Yeah, that's him. That's really not Luigi, y'all. Um, but uh, at least it was an Italian that played him. You know what I'm saying? But uh, what a wonderful time. So anyway, I want to bring your attention to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11. And we'll try to go through this. I'll, I'll try to get through it best I can. Last week, I, I tried to um, hopefully expound a little bit on apostolic anointing, and I'm going to be making some different distinctions between the apostolic and what the world sees as Christianity. <laughs> you already know it's going to be fun tonight. These little waters are killer. Man, I like those little things. Verse 23, by faith, Moses... When he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were 
and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Now, the New Living Translation has it uh, very closely, but let me read it to you. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. My God, you could preach on that verse to Americans. Y'all don't want me to go there. I see it in your eyes. Let me just read it one more time. It just sounded so good. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Mm. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to, to or rather to own, the own, to own the treasures of Egypt for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It's fascinating if we expound on these verses, but I'm going to try to take them in whole. But that last verse is pretty killer for Americans. Um, we think our treasure's here and we live as if it's here. Now, I'm going to say several things tonight that are going to be offensive. And some of y'all may say, well, what's new? But, but I, I'm not, I just want you to know I, I don't do it solely for the shock value or solely to try to be offensive. I want to challenge people. Challenge you outside your comfort zone. Stretch your mind. Stretch your faith. And this is what we need to do as Christians. And a lot of us just coast along thinking we can just coast along and, and have this, we come to church out of duty and obligation rather than this delight, natural delight we should have that, oh God, I'm going to fellowship with God's people today. Amen. Just like we do offering. We almost act, as a matter of fact, I may get with Pastor Nick and whoever does the offering from now on. We need to shout, play something, man. Play you dropped a bomb on me or something by the dad's band. We'll get the roller skates out and get down. But man, giving should be exciting. See, y'all didn't get it. It's, it's an exciting time for us to express our gratitude. It, it doesn't matter what your position is on offering and tithe. It doesn't matter if you want to be biblically wrong. That's fine. But the reality is, in the New Testament, Paul pretty much put it in a nutshell, basically comparing it to gratitude, a heart issue. Out of gratitude, I give. So if it's out of gratitude what God did for me and saved me, I should be excited to give. And not just excited to give 10%, but whatever God tells me to. Can I tell somebody tonight that sacrifice is not sacrifice if it's not felt? This is not the message. Don't worry, y'all all getting nervous. I thought I'd expound on Jim coming up here. But that should be exciting. It should be something. So I'll I'll try to be as as brief as possible. No, I won't. But I I want to just deal with with a made-up mind. See, when you have a made-up mind, Sunday morning is not an issue, ever. Can I tell some? Ever. Wednesday night, Pastor Doug, is never an issue when you got a made-up mind. Prayer meeting is not an issue when you got a made-up mind. Witnessing is not an issue when you got a made-up mind. Bible study, telling people about God is not an issue when you have a made-up mind. The ones that struggle with that are the ones that are not committed. Amen. Told you I'm going to get offensive first. I may not get off of the offense. When you have a made-up mind, it makes a difference. It makes a difference how you serve. Have you ever notice how miserable some people are? They're like, they drag into oh. like the Sunday morning. That one hour is is the most difficult out of all 168 in the week. That's the one that gets me every week. And more amazingly is that on Sunday, if some of you don't get a nap on that one day, you're a nasty human being. On one day, you don't nap any other day of the week. But if you miss Sunday, it's over. I'm setting my salvation on the side, and we're going to get down. Come on, y'all know I'm talking to some of you because y'all been that way. Pastor tried to call me at 3 o'clock on Sunday. He ought to know better. 
Hmm. Lucky I didn't show up at your door and kick it in. No, I'm, I'm just joking, whoever's watching. It's a joke. <laughs> just kidding. I don't do that anymore. I can't lift my leg that high. <laughs> a made up mind. When you have a made up mind, things are easy. When you have a made up mind that you're going to be committed to your wife or you're going to be committed to your husband, it's easy Amen. to stay married, even when, the, when it's like this. But see, as you get older and when your mind is solely made up, there's speed bumps, not dramatic crashes. <laughs> it, the hills and valleys turn into speed bumps. But see, when you don't have a made-up mind that I'm going to love her with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength as Christ loved the church, it's going to be hard for you to stay married. Oh. <laughs> and by the way, let me just interject here for you. I'm so sick of society being, for us following this Christianity that says we can divorce our wife or our husband just because we're not happy. You don't find it in Scripture. It's not of God, and you cannot convince me it's of God unless you can point to Bible. Unless some sin has overtaken your husband or some sin has overtaken your wife that is listed, don't come to me. Irreconcilable differences is not a reason for divorce. Amen. I, I don't know why I threw that out there, but somebody needed to hear it. Somebody watching maybe. And I hope they're typing a message because I'm loaded. <laughs> that just got on my nerve because I see people writing on it. Christian folks on Facebook Instagram, and now they got TikTok videos. These guys get all passionate about it. If your husband ain't making you happy, huh? Lord have mercy, that's too much of a task. If I don't have the joy of the Lord, <laughs> okay, let's move. I'm, I'm not giving a message on that. I'm sorry, I got all, way off. See, get back on notes, James. Stay, stay attentive, son. <laughs> a made up mind. A made up mind makes all the difference in the world. It just does. Made up mind, it's easier for me. I don't struggle with giving because my mind was made up. I'm going to give. That's it. So it's not a debate on it. I'm not going to debate you about it. I got a made up mind. See, I want to talk just a little bit because I think in the holiday season, we get a little bit distracted sometimes. And, and it's, you know, yes, it's a time of reflection, but it's also a time of distraction. We get so caught up in holidays that church becomes... An afterthought. Ooh, boy, I'm going to have fun here in a minute. We get so caught up in holidays that it doesn't matter what the pastor says, what the church says. By God, I'm going to do what I'm going to do because that's what I'm going to do. Well, good. See how pride and rebellion works out for you throughout eternity. You got to have a made up mind. So in holidays, we have this mass commercialization and then we have this mass, we, we call this thing and we, we get together. We'd rather get together with our unsaved loved ones than to come to a 30 minute or an hour church service. Come on. Come on, and say, listen, y'all ain't going to get me on this, I promise you. We had people for the last, my wife and I have been in church since 1990 and, I, and saved and I've been in the ministry uh, since about six months into my salvation. And I can tell you, we've had visitors and family. They stayed with us. They drove long ways. She was from Illinois. And all her people, if they came in, they knew we was going to church. Amen. You can stay here. You can go. That's either way. But you're going to miss me for a couple of hours. There you go. Oh, Lord. See, y'all don't do that no more. Because it's not popular to do that. And we're afraid we're going to offend. And I think it's a great testimony when you say, hey, I would love for you to go with me. But, man, I want to go put my praise on with my peeps. Mm. Three of you are nodding, the rest of you are all mad. Hmm. But in the holiday season, then you have this reflection time. But I want to share with you for a moment, a preacher moment, if you will, my prayerful sentiments and, and my heart about double-minded Christianity. And let you know that it will not survive in this present world. Hmm. Not only are we Christians... And that should be enough from a biblical perspective, certainly. But for the sake of what we're talking about tonight, we are apostolic Christians, Amen. which means something different. Even it means something special. <laughs> I told you it's going to get a little rough for a minute. I don't want to 
take anything away from anybody who calls themselves a Christian, anybody that comes to an altar of repentance and turns their heart to the Lord Jesus. I don't want to take anything away from that moment in their life. And, but, and I don't want you to misunderstand or take me out of context throughout this on my following assessment. But apparently, this is me talking, apparently my Christianity means something more to me and areas of my revelation seem to be different or even greater than some other Christians. Therefore, there are some Christians with whom I don't really want to be identified with. Come on. Come Told you it's going to get bad. <laughs> there are some that I don't even want to be identified with. There are some who call themselves Christians who actually do not even follow Jesus Christ. They never study his word. They never pick up his word. They never spend time in prayer with him. They never go to the house of God consistently. They never worship him with his, with his body on this earth. And they, there's very little about them that identifies them with Jesus Christ or makes them different from anyone else around them. You know, I know, Thanks to social media, we can find out that most people that say that they're Christ, they're Christians and they're following Christ look no different than anyone else that's ever been saved from and brought into his marvelous light. If there's no difference, what's the salvation process mean? If there's no difference, what does repentance mean? If there's no difference, what was the value of the cross? If sin wasn't an issue, the cross would have not have been a necessity. But apparently sin was a serious issue. So God, the sovereign God of the universe, came up with this plan of salvation and redemption for us. Not every Christianity is the same. And they don't worship him. They don't look like him. They're high-fiving and they're having margarita parties and tattoo parties and stuff in churches. And saying, it don't matter. A holy God and it doesn't matter. A righteous God and it doesn't matter. Give me a break. I have tattoos. I, my ear was pierced when I was really stupid. And that's nothing nowadays. They pierce heads and put spikes in their jaws and all that stuff. But when I did it back in 1981, 82, it was a rebellious punk. That's what I was. I did it. But all those things were before Jesus Christ saved me from an untoward generation. He pulled me out of, and turned, y'all aren't with me, see. Out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Well, if there's no change, oh, we are going to make me get there. See, none of that. That's not Christianity, and it certainly is not the Christianity that Christ envisioned or modeled around the world. Before you get all worked up tonight, before you get all bent out of shape, before you get mad at me, your Bible says that not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Come on. And your Bible further instructs that you know them that labor among you. It further goes on and tells us even to test the spirits to see that they be of the one true God. So I'm not making a judgment. I'm simply stating what the Bible, that it was a challenge then. So it was important enough to put in this concentrated manual we call the Bible, this life book that we have, that not everyone that says they're of Jesus are of Jesus. <laughs> so we got a lot of folks that are confused. And so they're taking word from every prophet and every snippet on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok and all these guys are, they're a prophet and they got a word and come to our function and go to this function. Don't be faithful to your church. Don't submit to a man, but send us. And what's so fascinating is they always want to charge you for their event. And then talk about how your church is all about money. Well, who's supporting you? Slack jaw. Y'all know Wednesday nights this way. We shouldn't put do video on Wednesday night. Really, we shouldn't. <laughs> this is probably why Sundays get, get lower and lower. Come on. <laughs> but your Bible says that you should know those that labor among you. Test the spirits. Our Christianity should mean something to us. If we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we should follow him in our attitude, our action, in humility, in power, and in grace. I was looking today trying to figure out how many people 
on, face, on all of those social media platforms. I don't even use a couple of them. I'm just on there and have people on there. I don't know why because I don't use them. But I think it was, in, it was roughly uh, 12,000, a little more than 12,000 was the best I could figure. Um, and people following, people message you and people talk to you. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about doing pseudonyms. But, but I would, I, if I'm honest with you, I don't know about 80% of those people. <laughs> I, I don't, I have people saying, hey, remember? No, I don't remember. Remember when you preached over, mm-hmm, but I don't remember you. <laughs> oh, okay, y'all remember everybody you've ever met. No, sir. And what's most amazing is that my life and post are not really interesting enough to follow. Come on. I'm not a very interesting person, really. I'm pretty boring. And I'm glad my wife didn't say amen. I was worried about that part of my lesson. But there's not much that, that is amazing. I, I rarely, I, I don't even use Twitter anymore because I hate tweeting. And now that Elon Musk bought it out, I may look at it. Okay, some of y'all got that. <laughs> I, use it, I use Facebook primarily. Well, my kids always tag me and stuff. So if you see stuff on my timeline, I don't know how to keep them from doing it. So um, I normally try to do stuff to provoke people and challenge people and encourage people. Uh, but but I, I, I just do that, but I don't know where people get the time to do this stuff 24-7, 365. I got to tell you, I'm not interested in where you went. Come on. I'm not interested in your v- vanilla latte from Starbucks or your Mojo famous frate, frappe or frappe, whatever those things. I don't do none of that stuff. If you don't drink black coffee out of a pot from your house, there's something bad wrong with you anyway. <laughs> and those that drink sodas in the morning, I love you, but man, you got something. That was for three people in here that I know do it. <laughs> one does Dr. Pepper, one does RC, and the other one does Coke. <laughs> Don't worry, they'll comment back. You'll know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's not really that interesting to me. I don't care if you're clipping your fingernails. Holy macro, man. Share that with somebody else when you're plucking ear hairs. Y'all have all seen it on, come on, if you've been on social media, they do goofy stuff. And then they get on there and air their dirty laundry. What's going on in the family? I mean, I had to share a post yesterday because I'm think, I read a post where a guy and his wife are publicly going at it on Facebook. And I'm like, hmm, something bad wrong with you. <laughs> right? I'm just not interested. It doesn't make sense to me, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't care. I don't care if you're opening your mail. I don't care if you just drove on a street. I don't care if you're holding your dog, right? And you'll see, look, look at them, man. They'll get 10,000 likes of doing something stupid. Come on. You post a scripture that's powerful and Holy Ghost anointed just out of the Bible, and two people like it, and, and the other three put the mean face and want to debate the scripture. <laughs> See, they, they're, they're, they're following me on there, but they're not following me like maybe you guys would, or, and they're certainly not following, as Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. They're just surfacely keeping, unfortunately, too many Christians are following Jesus like a Twitter account. Too many are following him like he's a Facebook messenger. They just sign in. They retrieve these sound bites, and, and now and then they get a little text here and a little text there and a private message over here, and they, they might pick up a nice quote once in a while, but there's no discipline of true daily discipleship. Our Christianity should mean something. Your Christianity should mean something to you. And I personally believe that our Christianity should cost us something. If it doesn't cost us something, then it's not worth having. It doesn't cost us something that's not worth anything. Our Christianity should cost us some time in our calendar. It should cost us some treasures in our bank account. It should cost us some temperance in our lifestyle, some humility and some modesty in our wardrobe, some discretion in our vocabulary, and some perfection in our attitude. Let me tell some of you something. Your propriety of speech does matter. Our Christianity should be full of light, seasoned with salt, abounding in good works. That's what it looks like. Our Christianity should be a live demonstration 
of the difference Jesus Christ has made in our lives. I shouldn't look anything like the guy that was saved 30 some odd years ago. When I see you, I shouldn't see the guy that used to be the drunk on the corner. I should see a drunk that was delivered from alcohol, a drunk that was delivered from tobacco, somebody that was delivered from something, an illicit lifestyle, pornography. Maybe you've been saved from depression. Something's got to be changed. Light cannot fellowship with darkness, yet when we say we're saved, we still got one foot out the door hanging on to something that we were supposed to let go of. It would be no surprise to most of you when I say that we live in a culture today that's hostile toward how we feel, toward our value system. They don't like followers of Christ because followers of Christ are judgmental. That's the word. They love, I hate doing air quotes. I apologize right now that I did them. They'll call you judgmental just simply reading Paul's writing in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. They'll call you judgmental just for saying something that Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 24. Hmm. There's no surprise that people would think that. We're navigating behind enemy lines as I speak. Let me assure you, this world is not my home. The song says, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I hope you don't have a permanent residence here don't ever make the fatal mistake of thinking this world is your home don't ever make the fatal mistake of thinking that this world is your friend that you can love the world and the things that are in the world and still love God and love God's word and inherit heaven that's not true at all your Bible says something totally differently. Jesus plainly said that no man can serve two masters. John, John the beloved wrote in 1 John 2, 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. Strong language, right? By the way, I didn't write that. There you go. So there's my judgmentalism. Being a Christian does not mean you can have the best of both worlds. It means you got to choose between the world or the kingdom of God. Amen. It's one or the other, not both. So if the world has more appeal to you than the kingdom, then you ain't in it. Come on. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. Can you hear that? For, further on, it tells us that you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Come on. That's what your Bible says. You pick it up and read it. By the way, it's the New Testament for all of you that discount the Old Testament. If the world's appeal is stronger on a Sunday or a secular activity or an extracurricular sport activity for your child is a stronger appeal than church or Sunday school. Mm. All my kids played sports and two of them did pretty good at it. Two of them, not so much. Actually, Jessica did good at cross country, but then she just quit doing it forever. And softball. And she quit doing it forever. I don't know what happened. About 10th grade, she gave up. She did cross country well. She must have had a camel hump or something on her back. She could run for like days. I'm not sure what that deal was. But anyway, I got off. See, there I go again. But you can't love the world and love the kingdom of God. It's impossible. Bitter and sweet can't flow out of the same fountain. Light can't fellowship with darkness. We know these things are said in the Bible and they've become almost cliche to us rather than a truth in his word. And we still try to hang on to those things. The only person Jesus ever told us to remember was Lot's wife. She was the woman who looked back at Sodom and Gomorrah as fire and brimstone was raining down upon it and it was buried in a massive grave. And when she looked back, the Bible tells us she was instantly turned into a pillar of salt. Why well, remember her? Why would he tell us to remember Lot's wife? I believe there's many reasons we can look at things or we can look at this scripture later on, but because she reached 
for two worlds and lost both of them. She wanted that in front of her, but that in back of her had a great appeal. He said, any man looking. We're more concerned about what's in the rearview mirror than what's ahead of us. Do you notice every weapon listed by the apostle is all offensive? Amen. <laughs> right? Come on. We're always playing defense as Christians. We're supposed to be taking ground, not giving ground. That's, That's Listen, I'm just going to throw these things out there. But see, she didn't want to be destroyed, but neither did she want to leave. James 1 says this, tell us, he tells us rather that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Those of you that are still appeal, that the world still appeals to you, but church appeals to you and God appeals to you and the things that God appeals to you, you're a double-minded person. A made-up mind makes a difference. A made-up mind can choose your eternity. If you and I are going to be fully devoted followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must choose which world we're going to be of. Come on. Some believers are in, in Christianity, but they are not of Christianity. Some believers, I've met people, and you have too, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. When was the last time you fellowshiped with the body? Well, I don't go nowhere because I don't like any church. I don't like organization. I don't like religion. Well, what kind of religion do you have now? Listen, if y'all going to get me on this stuff, you don't want me here. Come on. I'm so sick of be people beating up church. Amen. Hmm? Come on. Come on. This is a commandment. Gathering together, the gathering place, it's a commandment. I didn't write it. We assume Paul did, but I don't know who wrote Hebrews. Who cares? Amen. It's in there. Y'all like how I just did that? We have Christians now that they say, well, I'm a Christian. Man, where do you fellowship at? I don't go nowhere. Pastor hurt me. Somebody hurt me. This happened. That happened. I go over here. Normally, if you look at them close enough, they're so rebellious, you can see the devil in them. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Y'all know what I'm talking about. You can look at them and say, ooh. <laughs> you push the right button and you got a cat fight. See, they're only Christian in name only. They're what they used to call CEOs, Christmas and Easter. <laughs> they go, I remember growing up, my, my, mother's, my mother grew up Catholic and went to parochial school and all that. You know, that's what they did. Them Italian people named their people after uh, saints and all that kind of stuff. I guess I'm St. James. <laughs> I'm not sure where the Robert came from, but whatever. I don't know who Roberto is, but y'all get that later. But they all say, well, I'm Catholic. Where do you go? Well, I don't go, but I'm Catholic. I'm Baptist. When was the last one? Well, I hadn't been in 42 years. I'm Pentecostal. Where do you go? I ain't been. I was when I was a kid, and that's what my parents told me I was. That's not a true relationship, first off. They're only Christian in name. All new or, or all young apostolics at some point in their life go through an identity crisis. They have to figure out where they belong. Christians coming in must figure out where they belong. They must figure out who they are, who their people are, to whom they belong, and what they believe. That is important, by the way. What we believe is paramount. What they are living for. What we are willing to die for. You'll never find out what you're living for until you first figure out what you're willing to die for. Or maybe we could say it this way, you'll never die for him if you can't live for him. And if you can't live for him, you'll never die for him. We have this watered down thing today in America that if we were dropped over in the China churches where they have to have it underground and where they still persecute them or in some of the Middle Eastern countries where it is forbidden and they still behead Christians. <laughs> I, that's foreign to us, man. You man getting your head chopped off for believing in Jesus? That's pretty hardcore, man. 
So I'm believing in Jesus. And here they come with a machete and a hatchet. And you're like, ooh. And all of us talk tough over here. I would never deny him. Huh. That's why you'll always hear me say, my prayer is, God, help me be true. Amen. Help me be strong to the end. Help me believe and be strong to the end. I believe I would stand true, Doug. I don't, I've never been faced with somebody chopping my head off. I don't know. Or my grandkids' head. That happens, by the way, for those of you that don't know. The voice of martyrs is a good one to refer to. But if we can't live for him, we certainly wouldn't be willing to die for him. Moses came to a crisis point. He came to this crisis point. Scripture says that when he came to years, when he was mature, when he came to, of age, if you will, when he grew up, when he became spiritually aware of his direction in life, where he'd come from and where he was and where he was going and who he was, and when he got to that place in his life, he had to sit down and figure some things out. Yeah, he might have thought we could speculate. Well, I need to decide. I need to decide once and for all who I am. Am I an Egyptian or am I a Hebrew? Do I worship the gods of the Egyptians or do I worship the one true God of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I know that I'm an heir to the throne of Egypt. This must be rolling on his mind, or in his mind. But is that really who I am? Is that really me? Is that my destiny? Is that what's best for my life? Is that what's best for my future? He was attractive and alluring. And the offer and the things that he looked toward was attractive and alluring. Do I want to be or do I want what's at the end of that road in Egypt? Do I want to embrace my heritage as a Hebrew? And when Moses came to maturity, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses, in this process, you could say had a temporary identity crisis. All of us will get there if we've not already crossed that path. And some of us will do it multiple times through our walk and our journey. He had a temporary identity crisis. He had to stop and evaluate and figure out just exactly who he was. The Bible tells us Moses was born a Hebrew. He's a Hebrew by birth. His mother and father were children of Abraham. His God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His people were the people of the Hebrew race. His skin color was just a little bit different. His physical features were a little different. But more important than that, when he looked deep inside, something was telling him he was not an Egyptian by birth, by education, or by culture. And yet Moses' Egyptian mother figure was the daughter of the most powerful man in the world at that time. A man who presided over the most pagan, godless, idol-worshiping nation in all of earth. He was raised in that environment he was raised in Pharaoh's palace. He ate Pharaoh's food. He was educated in Pharaoh's schools. He was educated in Pharaoh's colleges. He had everything that he wanted as an Egyptian. Moses was well aware of the Egyptian culture. He was well aware of the way of life in Egypt. He knew their music. He knew their clothing style. He knew the food that they liked, the entertainment choices. He knew their overall philosophies. So when he became old enough to fully realize and understand the difference between the people of God and the people of Egypt, he knew he would have to make a choice. He couldn't straddle the fence on this issue. He was going to have to cast his lot with one group or the other. I will tell you more than ever, I believe, especially for parents that are navigating school-age children through life, you're going to have to figure out who you are. We have a lot of kids in this church and a lot of young parents. You're going to have to navigate those waters and figure out what, is the, what do I want, what is more important for my kids. I knew when Braden, Braden was a tremendous baseball player. He was a good basketball player. I would let him and Nick argue which one was better, but I think Nick probably had him beat. 
just because he was taller. But it, when he got old enough, I had to go to him and let him know, this is your choice now, not mine. You choose how far you want to go with this. You choose what's important. I never, he always knew that, hey, you're not going to, church, church was paramount. Your relationship with God was more important. Youth functions at church were more important than basketball camps. He still played in all the sports. He lettered. He did all that stuff. But he got to an age where he had to make his decision. Where do I fit? Who am I? So if you're navigating small children, I would encourage you, point them toward Jesus as long as you can because you will lose the control. Amen. And what you put in them when they're young. That's why he would tell us, train them up in the way they should go and when they're old. You say, well, my, that's not my kid. I know your kid's special. I realize your kid will never do anything wrong. But some kids do. Some teenagers actually rebel. Newsflash. Hmm. I had four of them. <laughs> and they're lucky to be alive. <laughs> See, you're going you're gonna to be forced in, into some situations at your school where you either stand for something or fall for anything. Either you speak up for what you believe or you be quiet and keep it to yourself. Some teachers challenge our kids and their faith. You say, no, not this one, not that one. You're not there 24-7. Please don't tell me you know what they're being taught. Some secular teachers take pride in pulling the rug of absolutes out from under your, your kids' feet. I went to, I, I was, not, I'm not proud of going to school so long and being all these things I did in education wise because I will tell you they challenge you at an early age to think outside of what you've been taught by your parents. And if your mind's not made up and your faith is not secure, you'll stumble. Hopefully, it'll just be a stumble and not a complete fall or failure. Your kids are not an experiment God gave you. They're a gift that he entrusted in your care. Amen. You don't experiment with them whether they should or shouldn't. You make that choice. It's in the parenting class. Grandmas and grandpas, if you have the influence over your grandkids, do the same thing. They feel it's their calling. Now, I always have to do this. Y'all should know me if anybody knows me. Don't go away from here and say pastors against education. Whether it be private or public, I'm not against education. Don't be silly. Okay? Is that, y'all pretty clear on that? I didn't leave any question marks. Okay, good. Because I hear it all the time. Well, I can't believe he said all that. Those are good people. <sighs> We're great at, as Christians at picking out the exceptions to everything. Okay, let's move on. But they'll do this and, and, and they feel it's their calling sometimes to question everything, to shake your faith, to turn it upside down. And can I tell you, if it's not there, it'll be somewhere else. Some of you are, some of you are being shake, shaken on your jobs. You're being questioned. You, they found out you're a Christian and all of a sudden you got somebody that's read the Bible more than you trying to trap you. And then you go, I, I don't know, let me call my pastor. Two or three of you in here have done that. Want me to debate your stuff. What you need to do is keep this zipped and get home and get in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> I'm, I, I, Lord Jesus right now, God. But even textbooks, books in the library that your kids can come across, they can challenge your faith. There's never been any concrete archaeological evidence that prehistoric man ever existed I'm fixing to mess y'all up. Carbon dating is one of the most flawed dating systems Amen. available. Come on. Come on. <clears throat> I told you I went to a small state university. I can just butcher everything. Get by with it because I didn't go to the elite one like Pastor Nick. <laughs> I couldn't afford that. <laughs> he probably goes home and goes, why does he do that all the time? <laughs> just because I'm smarter than him. More wool of fabrications and hoaxes have been pulled over the eyes of intelligent people 
than you can shake a stick at. More propaganda has gone out and we bought it as doctrine. Bible. Truth. Propaganda has been used by every government since the beginning of time. And the United States is no different. Let me just interject here for all of you that think the United States that you can trust the government. Here's what we do in America. Well, that sorry low life when the government gets somebody, that sorry low life should have done better. He shouldn't have done that. First thing we do is assault the American and believe the government. But you're the same people been eating GMOs that they approved six decades ago. Hmm? You wonder where all this cancer is coming from? All the additives that your government approved to go on food. Hmm? Oh, Vietnam veterans, why'd they get all their ears falling off and all that kind of stuff? Somebody just dropped, gave them some Asian orange. It's okay. Just a little chemical. Won't hurt them. Oh, 256,000 World War II veterans got radiation treatment because we tested the effects of radiation on them? Our government did that. Okay, y'all don't believe that one. Our government came up with the idea of projects. We put the Indians in a little place. We get them put over there and get them contained and then... After the Civil War, what did we do? We did the same thing to black people. Our government did that. It's control, man. It's mind games, propaganda, and we believe it. And so they use that to divide us based on socioeconomic background, based on race, based on creed, color, whatever it is. They're going to divide us because it's better if we're divided because united we can stand, but divided we fall. So what's the best way to keep Americans down? Keep them divided. That was a little bit of lesson for y'all. That was totally out of this. More wool has been pulled over our eyes than we could ever imagine. And so when somebody comes with truth, truth is so foreign, it's hard to accept. I've used the example before when I learned, when I started golf, I didn't start golf until I was in my 30s when I started, you know, getting going up the corporate ladder. I was a big wig. And uh, had to take the clients on the golf course. I'd never golfed. So I had some, some golf pro friends at courses, and, and uh, I went, and I said, uh, he goes, man, I can help correct that swing. I said, there ain't nothing wrong with my swing. That ball's supposed to go that way. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but can I tell you, after you've learned, swung the wrong way, learning to swing the right way, woo, it feel, you feel like you're going, hold on. Anybody ever done that? Huh? You get up there like a baseball bat. That's not how you swing a golf club. Then they tell you to line your finger up and lay that thing in there and you, you know, you do all that and keep this elbow stiff and do this. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy. I'll just live with the slice. I'll turn this way so it'll go that way. I don't care. I can't do all that stuff. My Lord. <laughs> Some of y'all must, y'all, right? It's, it's, but hey, that's the same way truth is. We've been spoken with lies so long and hoaxes and all of our politicians are a bunch of liars. How do you know that? Because their lips are moving. They may have started out with good ideas, but how do you go in where you've only been a bartender and you're 33 years old and you have no money, you, you've only been a bartender, that's it. You're 33 and now you're worth $28 million. How? Something's crooked. I've been working for 40 something years and I don't have a, t I don't, well, I don't have any, not a tenth. That wouldn't even been good. I don't have 0.001% of that. You know, I'm in that generation that hopes that Social Security's going to live out. Amen. <laughs> Is it going to be there? I don't know. Hopefully, my body will keep up till if God lets me live to 100, I know I'll keep working. As long as I don't turn into one of them babbling idiots. But see, we've been fed this diet so long. Now when truth comes, it's the same is true in Christianity. We grew up like mama and daddy told us to grow up, or grandma and grandpa believed it, so it must be truth. When the Bible plainly tells us that the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into all truth. Hold on a minute. Grandma and grandpa aren't. Doesn't mean they were all wrong, but it doesn't mean they were all right either. Amen. Come on. Right? Come on. Doesn't mean they were lost even. 
But God's truth, as he begins to reveal it, sometimes it will challenge us to the point that we have to reject. There's fabrications, hoaxes, and all these things. Neither, there's no evidence, no real evidence of the theory of evolution. Amen, come on. <laughs> there's just not. I know Charles Darwin had some ideas, but Charles Darwin is even taken out of context. He didn't even, didn't even intend that to be a religion. Some people grabbed a hold of his writings and said, wow, this is cool. We all came from some fish or amoeba or whatever. Just boom. And then you have the Big Bang Theory. That's a funny one. See, it's just, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation. Let me give you an example. If, if there is a watch, then there's a watchmaker. You can't throw two pieces of a watch into a washing machine and turn it on and 15 minutes later there's a complete watch there ticking. Oh, see, some of y'all, yeah, okay. Some, some, of, some people would want us to believe that that's how it works. Some of your fellow people and believers and some of your fellow family members, those who call yourself friends, will challenge your faith. Can I tell you that some People are putting your path on purpose to challenge your faith. And some of them have the same DNA you have. Let's just be real, most of them. Your family will challenge you. Does anybody know? Nobody in the middle? Anybody? Your family? Okay, one, two, all right, three, good. Four over here? Okay, good. Four people, and next week's lesson's online. But see, they're there to challenge you, and I know it hurts, and I, I understand it's painful to suffer rejection, but let me just tell you that when you suffer for Jesus Christ, you're having fellowship with him. Amen, come on. Moses' faith was challenged, and thank God Moses came out of his crisis on the right side of his faith. My prayer for us, for you, is that when you come to maturity in the Lord, when you come to that made up mind place, when you come to years, that you'll understand who you are. That you'll know that your mind is made up. That your mind is made up. I want to start next week on, on culture and what culture forces on us. We'll start there next week. I'll, I'll mark it, somehow mark it. How, there's a way to mark this thing. There we go. Marked. I can't go into that because it's 820. Why don't we stand? We'll get into it. Good. Did anybody get anything tonight? Amen. If you didn't, I had a blast. I want to challenge you. Don't just take things as they are. Don't just let people discredit your faith or your belief system just because they have a particular belief system. Get in the Word. But how can you? You say, well, Pastor, how can I deal with it? Pray fast. Get in His Word. Hide His Word in your heart. Amen. I'm not always going to be there. None of the other ministers in the church or, or the Bible answer man on the front row over here, they're not always going to be around. You have to get something in you and have a made-up mind. I believe that there's only one God, one faith, Amen. one baptism, one Lord of all. And his name is Jesus Christ. That's settled in my mind and nobody can take me from there. You can't split it up into, into dualities or pluralities or, or tritheism or Trinitarianism, any of that. There's one God that manifests himself. Father in creation, Son in redemption, Holy Ghost in regeneration. Why am I saying that? You've got to have some things settled in your heart. And by the way, what I just said to you is distinctly apostolic. That's one of the things we're going to be getting into is apostolic. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word, God. We thank you that your word challenges us, God.